Thank you for joining us this morning for Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and our program, Never Again, Holding Everyone Accountable. I am Dale Daniels, the Executive Director of Change, the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education here at Brookdale Community College. Today, we are honored to gather to remember the victims of the Holocaust and to honor the Holocaust survivors in our community. This week, there will be Holocaust remembrance programs worldwide, in synagogues and churches, in Holocaust centers and museums, government agencies, and will all have their own programs. We are honored this year to serve as the official commemoration for the state of New Jersey. I thank Paul Winkler, our dear friend, mentor, and the leader statewide in Holocaust and genocide education for joining us today along with the honored members of the commission. I also thank the dedicated members of CHANGE's Holocaust Remembrance Committee for their hard work and dedication to bring this program to us today. Never again is the phrase spoken time and time again in reference to the Holocaust. Sadly, we all know that our world never again, in our world, never again has truly been again and again, as genocide exploded in Cambodia, in Bosnia, Rwanda, and Darfur. We are acutely aware that there are many regions at risk of genocide at this very moment and suffering with extreme human rights crises, places like the Southern Sudan, Syria, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Oh. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, it is again and again for anti-Semitism, as it is still alive and well. Just last week, Jews in Donetsk, Ukraine, received an order, a flyer, ordering them to register with the government or face deportation and confiscation of property. Yes, the pro-Russian separatists deny connection to the flyers, but nevertheless, that document is a clear attempt to stoke anti-Semitism and intimidate the Jewish residents. Our Holocaust survivors here today can speak to the fact that that is intimidation, and they know that the Holocaust did not start with Auschwitz. It started with edicts such as this and intimidation. So clearly, never again is not enough. It must be never again holding everyone accountable. It is now my honor to introduce to you Dr. Marie Murphy, President of Brookdale Community College. Good morning. And on behalf of the faculty, staff, and administration at Brookdale Community College, I welcome you here to our college. I'm honored to be here at this event, and I'm also deeply, deeply honored and appreciative of the work that change does in the midst of our college. The learning that happens for our students is palpable and real. I love that change has extended itself so far into our community, into our elementary schools, our middle schools, and our high schools. If you haven't seen the current exhibit, 100 Days of Silence, I really suggest you do so, because that is an illustration of how deep the work of change goes into our community, how powerful it is, and it gives us optimism for the future that young people are learning in a very real way the lessons of history, the things that we want them not to forget. We want them to internalize never again. I'm going to give you a little incident that happened yesterday that is just one of many. Yesterday was bring your sons and daughters to work day and my children are grown so I borrowed some children. I had a pair of 13-year-old twin girls who are the daughters of one of our trustees at the college. And we were walking across the college. We went through the library and passed change. And they paused and said they had been studying Rwanda in school, and they knew that they were going to come to this exhibit, and they were looking very much forward to it. And they were horrified by what they had learned about Rwanda. And, and they spoke 
quite knowledgeably about it. So clearly, somebody is doing a very good job in those schools. And as we're walking along, one of them turned to me and said, those things are important. We can't ever behave like that. You know, they're asking p Jews to register in the Ukraine, and that is wrong. Something needs to change there. And I got teared up. And I thought, we have 13-year-olds who know that. And it gives me hope for our future. Even when these frightening things are happening in 2014, something that we just thought was unimaginable, there are young people who are willing to stand up and say, that is wrong. So maybe the message of never again will be internalized by this next generation because of the work of places like Change and all of you. So thank you, and welcome to Brookdale. Thank you so much, Dr. Murphy. It is now my pleasure to introduce my friend and mentor, Dr. Paul Winkler. Over the past 50 years, I know you won't be able to believe that when you see him, but he has been in education for more than 50 years. Paul has been a teacher, a principal, a superintendent, a regional education director, the New Jersey Deputy Assistant Commissioner of Education for Exceptional Children at the New Jersey Department of Education, and director of a teacher training center. Boy, it's amazing that he could handle all those years of education, but thank goodness that he's with us. But of all of these roles, we are most grateful for his leadership and support as executive director of the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Paul Winkler. President, please thank the two 13-year-olds for all of us. They are the hope for the future. That was beautiful to hear. Usually I'm standing in the back somewhere, but today I'm humbled to be the representative here today for the statewide observance of Yom HaShoah for the state of New Jersey. I am thrilled to be with the survivors, the friends, the committees, the people that have made a difference. For us to ensure that the future, I'm feel, I feel good inside when I see survivors. Just today, a survivor, a former commission member, Ruth Millman showed me a little story that the children wrote when she spoke to them. You could feel it in their heart and in their words that they care and that years from now they will remember. We have to build on that every day. Our survivors are out there speaking, going whenever they can. And then change helps in that process. We have to continue so we can ensure that the stories of the Holocaust, the experiences, not today and tomorrow, but in the future, are told, are remembered, are felt, and something happens, something is done. And those students, those 13-year-olds, you have to feel it and know it, that something will be done and they will be and make a better society. We're very fortunate today, and it's really an honor for me. Almost 20 years ago, uh, Fort Monmouth and, uh, started a program right on the base. And Sister Mary Gamolko uh, was, brought her original group of young people to sing for us. And we were just reminiscing, light one candle. And I still sing, think that song and sister is with us today who led the Mount St. Mary's all girl chorus and uh, the survivors and the audience, many of, can you just stand up for a second so they can see you? And <laughs> sister is going to be honored this year at the Sister Rose Theory evening of roses. 
So that's a tremendous company and a wonderful, wonderful person who was trained by then she did not know it, her piano teacher who was a Holocaust survivor. So there's goodness in that heart and goodness in the people here and now we have to take it and make the world a better place. Thank you and thank you for being the state program this year. Good afternoon, I should say good morning. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here and to hear from our esteemed guest, Hannah Rosenthal. Even as the Holocaust becomes further removed in time, its lessons remain timeless and just as relevant today. That's why the work the change does is so important, educating about the dangers of human rights, abuse, and other genocide today. The Jewish Federation works to strengthen our community with a focus on education and working with our partners to do so. We are proud to help sponsor this event. We also want to let you know, if you know any Holocaust survivors in need, please contact our partner, the Jewish Family and Children's Services. They may have resources to help you. Please see Miriam at the back table after, more, after the event for more information. Thank you and continue doing your great work. And now I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker. Hannah Rosenthal is living a life that is marked by passion for social justice and has a career of service advocating for Jewish causes. We have written a long list of her achievements in our program, but I do want to mention some of them right now. She has served as special envoy and the head of the office to monitor and combat anti-Semitism in the Obama administration for three years, from November 2009 until October 2012. Ms. Rosenthal was named one of the Forward 50, a list of the most influential Jews selected by the Forward newspaper. Her father was a Holocaust survivor, a former prisoner at the Buchenwald concentration camp, and a reform rabbi. Ms. Rosenthal herself attended graduate school for rabbinical studies at Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem and Los Angeles and holds a bachelor's degree in religion from the University of Wisconsin. Currently, she is the CEO and president of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation and is on the Committee on Holocaust Denial and State-Sponsored Anti-Semitism of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's my honor to present to you today Hannah Rosenthal. Can you hear me? Okay, and if it slips, put up your hands. It is Yom HaShoah. It is a day for three major purposes. One is to remember, is to remember what happened. The basic message of the Holocaust must always be, it is the possible. It happened, and when people say it can't happen again, the answer has to be, it happened. So what is it that happened? And we educate our students, we tell our family stories, and we try to make sense out of the most major human rights abuse ever in history. The word genocide came out of the Holocaust. The world said, what was that? And what were we doing? And so Yom HaShoah is a time to remember. The beautiful music that you played included the partisan song, an anima amin, that in spite of everything, the survivors had faith. I'm not sure I could have had that strength. So in addition to remembering, Yom HaShoah is a day to honor. 
to honor the survivors, the people who are telling their stories, and to honor the lessons they gave us, the power and the strength of the human spirit, and think about it, the survivors came through hell. But they don't tell us to be bitter. They know how to be joyful. They know how to celebrate life. And so when we're down, we have to remember and honor that spirit. And finally, Yom HaShoah is a day to stop and learn. Now you've had 20 years of a mandate of Holocaust and genocide education. I, I'm from Wisconsin, we're just thinking about starting that. It'll be hard. Huge German population in Wisconsin. But I had the great honor in the first term of this administration to serve in the State Department as an ambassador at large. Now some ambassadors, most ambassadors, get a country. I got a topic. And my topic was global anti-Semitism. The first thing I learned while there is that no one knows what anti-Semitism is. We ask our embassies, our consulates, our representatives around the world to monitor anti-Semitism, but they don't know what anti-Semitism is. And I'm proud to tell you that during my term, we have an official U.S. government definition of what anti-Semitism is, which, like your mandate, means we're training all of our diplomats that go around the world. This is what it is. So many said to me, they're not rounding up Jews anymore. That anti-Semitism equals the Holocaust. As if the Holocaust was an aberration that happened for a few years, nothing before, nothing after. How do we make sense of it? We learn the history. We learn the myth and symbol that was part of a people that became willing executioners. By the way, while I was gallivanting around the world representing you, the American people, and learning so much, I realized that there was an assumption that young people don't want to learn about the Holocaust. Enough already, Holocaust fatigue, I don't want to talk about it anymore. You might know that in October, a study was released by the Pew Survey Company, a very reputable company. And for the Jewish community, it was um, eye-opening to many on what was in there and how different the millennials, those born in 1980 and later, feel about their Jewish identity. And while there's hand-wringing because their Jewish identity is very different than my generation and certainly my father's and my mother's generation, the number one issue that they focus on about their strong Jewish identity is remembering the Holocaust. 72% of the millennial survey said the number one important issue to my Jewish identity is remembering the Holocaust. There is not Holocaust fatigue. There is the reality. So what did I learn? As I traveled around, I identified six major trends in anti-Semitism. And I want to briefly go over them with you. The first is old-fashioned anti-Semitism is alive and well. And by that I mean religious anti-Semitism, where Jews are despised and hated because from their pulpits they are learning, we killed God. Even though history tells a different story, Pope John XXIII said, you're not supposed to teach that anymore. 
it remains. So religious anti-Semitism is alive and well. You hear it spewed in the Middle East. It kind of combines with conspiracy theories. Jews are out to control the world, run the banks, run all the media and communication systems. That's how we plan to control the world. And if you have any doubts, you read about it in the famous czarist forgery called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is taught as a textbook in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan. A textbook, it's now online, getting millions of hits regularly. So what has been discarded as a complete forgery, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, for those of you who don't know about it, was a claim that they found the papers of Jews planning to take over the world. And that's what the protocols were. And it came out of Russia, which today seems quite apt to point that out. So the conspiracy theories, when I was in Egypt and I was speaking to a university class of several hundred people, the professor said, and will you talk about the who really did 9-11 in the United States and the role Ju the Jews played. I'm rarely speechless. The professor of an esteemed university. So conspiracy theories, religious anti-Semitism, and you hear more and more about blood libel. Now, the blood libel accusation against Jews is basically Jews kill Christian children to use their blood to bake matzah. I don't know who made that up, but it's quite a, a remarkable accusation that has stuck. In 2011, a parliamentarian in the Ukraine stood up and warned, warned his fellow parliamentarians that Passover and Easter were coinciding. And we have to be very careful, he said, because this is when Jews kidnap our children. When I met, I have to talk about Ukraine. It's in the news. Hard to figure out what's going on. When I was there the first time, it was right after the election. And Yanukovych had just been elected. And the big question was, was he going to look east or was he going to look west? So we all, all diplomats, were coming to encourage them to look west. As we now know, they didn't. And I'm meeting with Grushenko, who is the foreign minister, in a big Soviet-style meeting room, long, big table. My entourage is with me on this side. His entourage is with him on that side. And our conversation is through an interpreter. And I said, you know, I'm very glad to be here. He says, we love our Jews. We've always loved our Jews. There is no anti-Semitism in Ukraine. You don't have to worry about a thing, but thank you for coming. And you might be very interested to know that we just finished an investigation. I said, what was the investigation? And he said, the foreign minister, that's our secretary of state, said, we just finished an investigation because there was an accusation that Jews had kidnapped 25,000 Ukrainian children to steal their organs. And my, my embassy and my staff remembers this very well because I stood up and leaned across the table and I said, you did what? You investigated such a crazy and absurd accusation. And in perfect English, not through the translator, he said to me, Ambassador Rosenthal, we had to investigate it. Jews have done it in the past. We have to make sure they're not doing it now. But the investigation showed we're not missing 25,000 children. So that was supposed to make me happy. Blood libel has morphed into also organ stealing. So those old-fashioned kinds of anti-Semitism are alive and well, but there are five other trends that are newer. One is 
Holocaust denial is going up. At the same rate, our Holocaust survivors are leaving us, are leaving this life. The correlation is profound. And what the Holocaust deniers are saying is it never happened. It's all part of the Jewish conspiracy. To, they dominate, you know, the Jews dominate all the communication systems so they keep the message alive. Now, lest you think that's just a few crazies, let me tell you that the day, I, um, on January 27th, the United Nations commemorates the Holocaust. They don't do it on Yom HaShoah. And there's always a delegation every five years to Auschwitz. And the president allowed me, appointed me to be part of his delegation. It's freezing cold, it's 40 below zero. And I look at the survivors and I say, I have no idea how you possibly could have survived winters like this. Never mind the torture. But the survivors were there in force. And it was an extremely moving um, ceremony and experience. And then I got into my car and my staff person for the embassy hands me his Blackberry and says, I think you'll be interested in this. And the Bishop of Krakow, Poland. Now, Krakow, you go to if you're going to go to Auschwitz. It's the city. It's a lovely city. The Bishop of Krakow made a statement on January 27th that said, the Holocaust didn't happen. This is much ado about nothing, and the only reason it's being perpetuated is because the Jews own the media. So this isn't, this is somebody of great importance in the city of Krakow down the road from Auschwitz. Holocaust deniers, you know, uh, John Paul II, I, I'm mentioning the two that are becoming saints. John Paul II told a group of um, Catholic leaders that they could no longer be under the umbrella because they were Holocaust deniers, the Secret Society of Pius X, SSPX it's called, and removed them. And they became outside the mainstream. Why? Because they were espousing that the Holocaust never happened. They were teaching that. And so the Pope rightfully said, not under my watch. And then Pope Benedict came in and reinstated them. And that's what I went to the Vatican about. It was like, until you release your archives so that we can see what happened and the role of the Vatican, you really shouldn't be bringing people in and out who are Holocaust deniers. I saw Holocaust denial in Sweden. I saw it in Uruguay. I, of course, saw it in Venezuela. I saw it all over. And it's breathtaking. It's breathtaking that in today's day and age, with education as sophisticated as it is, with media and social media available to so many, movies, unbelievable movies of international acclaim about the story of the Holocaust, people still think it did not happen. And Holocaust denial, while we in America proudly treasure our First Amendment, as we should, we don't make it a crime, but Holocaust denial is part of the definition of anti-Semitism, according to the United States government. Another trend is the other side of that coin, Holocaust glorification. I watched a video of Karadawi, um, a very esteemed uh, Muslim scholar on Al Jazeera, and his following is huge, uh, 10, 20 million listen to him. And I watched as he showed pictures, you're all familiar with the videos and the pictures we have of the Holocaust in real time. And he looked at it and he said, isn't this wonderful? God willing, we will be the perpetrators to finish the job. 
in marches in the Baltic countries on the day that they celebrate the end of communism. And they march down their main streets in Latvia, in Estonia, in Lithuania. The, vet, the veterans of the SS are in uniform. A lot of it doesn't fit them. And they march, and they get the largest applause. Remember, Estonia was the first country to be Judenfrei, free of Jews. Glorifying it. It was a great thing. Too bad it didn't finish it. The opposite of denial. And then there's a trend that's somewhere in the middle. And I know you all hear it at some point. Well, it happened, but it really wasn't six million, and oh well, it was really this, and it was never the gas, and you know, people denying and changing the story to minimize the reality, to minimize your suffering, to minimize that chapter of history from Holocaust denial to Holocaust glorification and Holocaust Cost relativism is what I call it. All three of those trends are part of the U.S. definition of what is anti-Semitism. And there are two more trends I want to quickly mention. One is, when does legitimate criticism of a policy of the State of Israel cross over into anti-Semitism? And I will be honest with you, this is the issue I spent most of my time with when I was ambassador. When does it cross over? Now, I instituted this training so people are learning about anti-Semitism. Not all criticism of policies of the state of Israel makes one an anti-Semite, or over 50% of Israel would be anti-Semitic. I criticize policies of my government, I, you've just heard me, criticize policies of Ukraine, of Lithuania, of, 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 of most of the countries, and my own, and Israel. That doesn't make me an anti-Semite. But when you do three things, it does cross the line. When you treat Israel the sovereign state of Israel, differently than all other countries. That's crossed the line. Why are you, you know, why are you only calling out rights, uh, human rights violations on the state of Israel? Do you know this? The Human Rights Council of the United Nations is kind of comical. Some of the people who sit on it are leaders of countries abusing their people with impunity. But their agenda, and these become very important in the diplomatic world, what is the agenda? At the only country that has a permanent agenda item on the Human Rights Council is human rights abuses by Israel. That's singling out Israel and treating them different than all other countries. And that crosses the line. When Jews are blamed for all the ills of the world, if it weren't for the Jews in Israel, the whole Middle East would be fine, and there wouldn't be this, and there wouldn't be that, and it's all because of the Jews in Israel. The collective Jew which is viewed as Israel. When that language, that rhetoric, and that behavior happens, then it has crossed the line. And the third test, besides singling out and holding to a different standard, and dealing with all Jews as the collective Jew, Israel, in hatred, is a complete delegitimization of Israel as a country. It never had a right to exist, it doesn't have a right to exist, and we need to get rid of it. Now, there is a scenario where somebody could be saying this, and they're not anti-Semitic, and that would be somebody who thinks that what happened in the early, in the mid-40s, when the world woke up to what had just happened in World War II, 
And it is true, the British you know, dominated a whole part of the world. And the world divided, made lines. And in those lines came Jordan, came Lebanon, came Saudi Arabia, came Israel, and many other countries. And a Palestinian state, by the way. Palestinian state never happened because Jordan took over that, that piece of land. But if you believe that at that point in history when drawing the lines was the wrong thing to do, it's a legitimate historical argument. But I don't hear anyone arguing that Saudi Arabia doesn't have a right to exist, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, none of them have a right to exist. Only Israel does not have a right to exist from that drama and that point in history that clearly crosses the line. Where that line gets crossed, the most common questions I would be asked by our embassies, by our consulates around the world. There, you know, when the uh, flotilla from Turkey came and tried to bring human, humanitarian aid to the Palestinians, and Israel blocked that, that flot flotilla, and there was loss of life. There were, you know, protests all over the world. And I'd get a call, is this anti-Semitism? And I'd say, what do the signs say at the protest? Are they protesting the policy that Israel intervened? That's not anti-Semitism. But when they're saying Hitler was right, Jews back to the gas chamber, that's not criticizing a policy of the state of Israel. That's hatred of the collective Jew. And that crosses the line. So slowly, slowly, our diplomats around the world are learning this and we'll be able to better identify what's happening in countries. And the last trend we are seeing in the headlines of our papers every day. And that is this, I would say wave, but it's more like a tsunami of ultra-nationalism that is happening around the world. Lithuania is for Lithuanians only you know, what Russia's doing with Crimea and now planning to go into Ukraine. The ultra-nationalists, Hungary, when they do their census every year, they don't count people who are only in the borders of Hungary. They still count people of Hungarian ethnic um, ancestry around the region. They still haven't gotten over that they're not a world power anymore. This ultra-nationalism, first of all, is bad for everybody because anyone who is other is on their list of hatred. And it certainly isn't good for the Jews. And worth pondering on Yom HaShoah because if we learn what happened during the Shoah, the Holocaust, we know it was ultra-nationalism that moved people. It wasn't just the Grimm's fairy tales that in the day those weren't witches, those were Jews. It isn't only what they heard from pulpits in their churches, mosques. It also was inside hatred of the other. Germany is the best. I tell you, my father was a Holocaust survivor. And when it came time to buy a car, my mother wouldn't buy anything German, and dad would say, we should buy it because it's the best. A country that killed every member of his family, and he still has this, Germany's the best. Go figure. Those six trends, ultranationalism, where, it cross, where legitimate criticism of Israel crosses over into anti-Semitism, Holocaust glorification, Holocaust relativism, and Holocaust denial, not to mention the good old-fashioned anti-Semitism. Alive and well. And Jews continue to be used as pawns. Now, I asked Eva, um, Eva Weiner, who I met when I decided the last thing I was going to do as ambassador, as I go around the world shaking my finger at people, how could you not take the Jews? How could you do this to the Jews? This is what's happening now. I used to talk about myself as the ambassador of finger-wagging. 
I decided the last thing I would do before I left the State Department was hold the United States accountable. And the United States accountability during the Holocaust is reprehensible. And it was largely the United States State Department, the department I was working in. When Jews in, in when synagogues and churches around America raised lots of money, millions, and in those days, that was tons of money to get Jews out. It was the State Department that didn't allow the money to go. It was the State Department that changed memos to the president. So there wasn't mention of what Ambassador Dodd in Berlin was saying, and what other ambassadors in the region were saying, it's very bad for the Jews. When I watched the presentation of the flags, I, I have to tell you, I get choked up. Because I am a proud American. And part of why I'm a proud American is we're begun, beginning to face our accountability during World War II. And it's being called into question as Rwanda happened. You know, President, Clinton says it's the biggest cloud over his presidency. He still has nightmares about not intervening in that genocide. And Sudan, and Syria, and Cambodia, and Congo. And there are genocides happening or brewing all over the world. And there are people in the United States government that are saying, we must intervene. We must do something. Now, we diplomats say things. The country has more than being able to say things. You can do it through economic sanctions. You can do it through military intervention. And so I think the United States is starting to recognize that Secretary Hull is not someone to honor. Secretary Hull is responsible for the deaths of probably millions of Jews. So my last thing to do as ambassador was to call the United States accountable. And we decided to focus on the St. Louis, the ship that famously sat full of refugees and we wouldn't let them in and sent them back. And there are survivors and Eva is one of them. And I met her at the State Department when we brought 16 survivors of the St. Louis. And may I say that Hillary Clinton couldn't be there because the General Assembly of the, of the uh, UN opened that day. But she sent her deputy, who started by saying, this is long overdue. Welcome. I lost it. It's a beginning. Most people in the United States government have no clue about what we did, but it's starting. And it's starting because we're holding people accountable. And we're not whitewashing our history. FDR did wonderful things for this country. He did not do wonderful things for the Jews. So that's what's happening. That's what I'm seeing around the world. And if I haven't thoroughly depressed you, I haven't done my job. Yom HaShoah is not a day to be depressed. It's a day to remember, it's a day to honor, and it's a day to learn. And let's all do that together and insist everyone we know do the same. Thank you. This morning, we remember those who perished in the Holocaust with the lighting of seven candles by survivors who will be accompanied by Navy personnel from NAD Earl. The first six candles represent the six million European Jews, including one and a half million children that were murdered through sickness, starvation, firing squads, and the gas chambers. And as the research continues, that figure could be revised upwards. The seventh candle is for the annihilation of defenseless people, including Sinti and Roma or gypsies, homosexuals, the handicapped, Jehovah Witnesses, Freemasons, and other political and religious dissidents. 
The ceremony of remembrance begins with a musical presentation by the Marlboro High School Chorus and String Quartet, directed by Mr. Patrick Dalton. Thank you. 